Welcome, 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 everybody, to another Sunday of When Black Women Gather. My name is Helen Higginbotham, and we're here today to have a, a very timely and necessary conversation about politics in the, um, in the U.S., although our candidate that we're speaking to today is from New Jersey, um, Congress, uh, I'm sorry, Senate hopeful um, Larry Hamm, um, who will be interviewed today by uh, Linda Carter and Bill Davis, our two favorite professors, so I get to chill in the background a little bit. Um, but we're going to talk about the um, the importance of you know of, of voting for all of us and what why is this election in 2024 so crucial? And um, whatever your aspirations are, whatever your frustrations may be, we got to put that aside, y'all, and we got to step out and vote. Um, I am very happy that we're talking to Larry today. Larry is, like I said, running for the um, U.S. Senator vacancy um, in New Jersey, which will be vacated soon, if not already, <laughs> uh, by, um, what's his first name, <laughs> Rob Menendez. And mm -hmm. the um, reason that's important to all of us, whether we live in New Jersey or not, is because when we have a U.S. senator, they speak for all of us, right? They're able to vote on matters that affect all of us across the country. So don't mm -hmm. think that, you know, this is a Jersey thing and I'm not interested. We're all very interested. And I also see this as an opportunity for us as Black people to um, challenge ourselves to pull our resources, you know, our votes, our voices together and back. Um, a candidate that looks like us, that will speak for us, that will represent us. I'm not, I'm a Jersey girl, but y'all know I'm in Florida. <laughs> um, but still, I, I wholeheartedly support Larry as a candidate. I don't know him personally, but I've only always heard very, very positive things about him. So I look forward Thank to you. Linda and Bill interviewing him, who both know him intimately. So on that note, um, the topic of our conversation today is the election of a U.S senator in New Jersey and why it matters to you. And this will be an open conversation um, once Linda and Bill open it up to everybody. And um, I expect that it will be a lively discussion. So on that note, I'm going to bow out and bring all the other players on screen and you guys can take it from there. And I appreciate everybody for showing up today. Um, it's a good Sunday because there's no football. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you know how y'all get. Football is not important right now. Hold on, I'm putting everybody on spotlight, and now I got to do Larry. And there we go. So I'm going to mute Linda and Bill. Thank you so much for doing this this Sunday, and I look forward to a lively discussion. Okay, well, welcome everyone. I'm happy to be here and have this opportunity to talk to my brother that I've known for so many decades. Anyway, um, you know, as I said, I'm happy to introduce Larry really quickly, but I'm not going to do a lot of talking because he and I are in the same room and I want to make sure he gets as much information out to you guys as possible. I will basically talk to Larry about two things. One is what is it that qualifies him based on his life to get to the point where he feels he has the capacity to handle this position as U.S. Senator? And then to, um, from, you know, more of a civics point of view, talk about the actual role and purpose of a U.S. Senator and committees and things of that sort. So I have about four questions, but I'm going to give Larry a chance to do his explanation, which he's very good at. So Larry, why don't we just start with, well, I had mentioned earlier that, you know, I've known you for a long time. I even know, know who your high school sweetheart is. And we just found out recently that our Fathers were buried in the same cemetery, World War II vets. So I think it's yeah. important that people know that you have a history with regard to the U.S. military indirectly or directly. Um, but I do want you to take this opportunity to provide our audience with some highlights of your life that you feel have prepared you to serve in this capacity on behalf of the New Jersey public as U.S. Senator. So if you can you know, spend some time giving us some highlights from your bio. Well, first of all, uh, at the outset, uh, I want to say thank you for having me on today, and thank you to the entire organization uh, for this opportunity to talk to you. And let me say basically that the Constitution of the United States requires three things for a U.S. Senator. You have to be at least 30 years of age. 
You have to be a United States citizen and you have to reside in the state that you represent. So with regard to those few qualifications, I fulfill all of them. Um, I have been in political life. Uh, I'm 70 years old. I just turned 70 last month. I'm a father of three daughters, all of whom are college graduates. Uh, I'm very proud of all of them. They, they all have good careers now. Uh, and I'm a grandfather. Uh, my middle daughter, uh, Nia, my three daughters, Laini, who is a nurse, uh, Nia, who is a television reporter uh, and anchor, and uh, Imani, who is a political consultant. And uh, Nia is married, and uh, she and her husband, Jason, are the proud parents of my grandson, Eli. So, uh, I've been involved in political life for 52 years. Uh, this journey for me started when I was 17 years old. Um, when I was a senior at Arts High School, the school system was uh, embroiled in controversy. Uh, the whole city actually was embroiled in controversy. I guess we could say in the contemporary sense from 1967, the Great Newark Rebellion of 1967, which uh, led to the election of Newark's first black mayor, Kenneth A. Gibson. But the school system was in an uproar because there had been two teacher strikes, one in 1970 and the second one, which was the longest one in United States history, teacher strike, uh, in 1971. And as the leader of the student government at Arts High School, uh, we were informed that if students miss 35 consecutive days of school, we weren't going to graduate. And so as seniors, uh, we were all alarmed, right? And usually the student government is not, they really don't deal with serious, serious issues. But when that issue came up, everyone turned around and said, Larry, what are you going to do about that? You know, so we... Uh, came together, the student government, and we planned a uh, a walkout, a march from Arts High School to uh, then the Gateway Hotel, which today is the Doubletree Hotel, same building across the street from Penn Station. Uh, we walked out of Arts High. We marched down town to the Gateway. About 400 of us and about 200 of us got in, and we sat in. This was in March of 1971. Uh, after some time there, uh, the mayor of Newark showed up, Mayor Ken Gibson, first black mayor of Newark. And he said he was concerned about us, that he would deal with our concerns because we were not only concerned about our graduation, since we were marching and protesting, we thought that was a good opportunity to raise some demands as to what we thought was needed to improve education in Newark. He said he would deal with our demands and he didn't want any of us to get hurt or get arrested because they must have had all the police cars and all the fire trucks in Newark there at the time. So we ended the sit-in and then about two months later, about two weeks before I graduated from Arts High, uh, the mayor asked me if I would be willing to serve as a full voting member of the Newark Board of Education, not a student representative, but one of the nine. And on July 1st, 1971, I was uh, appointed to the Newark Board of Education. And I think I still hold the record uh, as being the youngest school board member, fully voting school board member in the history of the country. And that was the beginning of my political sojourn. Uh, of course, I was uh, uh, interacting a lot with Mayor Gibson, who I actually worked for as an aide uh, that summer I was appointed. And then I met Amiri Baraka, and it was Amiri Baraka that uh, helped me to find many of the ideas that I still embrace today, many of the political ideas. And I was very much influenced by Amiri Baraka the Black Power Movement, particularly the Black Nationalist Movement at that time. And um, I, I had started at Princeton in 1971, but the burden of being a student 
and a school board member was too much. I withdrew from Princeton in the during my first semester and came back home to serve full time as a school board member and also as an aide to Central Ward Councilman Dennis A. Westbrooks. And I served those three years on the board. They were quite controversial. Uh, but when my term was up, I returned to Princeton University uh, in 1974 again as a uh, freshman. Uh, eventually, I went on and uh, finished my undergraduate work at Princeton and graduated cum laude in 1978. But while I was at Princeton, I was um, one of the leaders of the anti-apartheid movement on Princeton's campus. And after four years of demanding that Princeton withdraw its funds from companies doing business with South Africa, uh, it was on February 1st, 1978, that we began 66 of consecutive days of picketing Nassau Hall, which culminated in a sit-in at Nassau Hall. And as a result of that sit-in in which 210 of us participated, um, Princeton divested from several of the major companies uh, that were doing business with the racist apartheid regime. I did some graduate work at Princeton. I did some doctoral work at Princeton University. However, I left Princeton in 1980, returned to Newark. Um, I was elected as a district leader uh, in the West Ward. But at that time, I also formed two organizations. One was the People's Energy Cooperative. The other was the People's Organization for Progress. The People's Energy Cooperative was uh, an association of 400 home owning families that used heating oil. And instead of buying uh, their heating oil separately, we collectively and cooperatively purchased that oil and was able to do so at less than the market rate. But it was the People's Organization for Progress uh, in which I poured most of my energy founded in 1982 to work for racial, social, economic justice and peace. I was one of the founders and have been the chairman of the People's Organization for Progress. And we will um, observe uh, our 42nd anniversary this year. Just a couple more highlights, uh, please. Um, I also, uh, during in the 1980s, uh, I was involved in Jesse Jackson's 1984 campaign. Uh, and I was state co-chair of the Jesse Jackson campaign in 1988. I was also a delegate to the Democratic National Convention. I was a Jackson delegate in 1988. Uh, in 1995, I was the state chairman of the New Jersey Million Man March Coalition. Although New Jersey is one of the smallest states in the union, we had, according to the Wall Street Journal, one of the largest delegations of men at the Million Man March. Some 75,000 men, it's estimated, came out of New Jersey on the 255 buses under the banner of the New Jersey Million Man March Coalition and uh, also on trains and buses and planes. Um, more recently, um, I was uh, um, a supporter of Bernie Sanders' campaign in 2016 uh, for president. In fact, I was a delegate uh, for Bernie Sanders uh, at the uh, 2016 Democratic National Convention. And in 2020, I was state chair of his uh, campaign here in New Jersey. Uh, I also ran for US Senate in 2020. So this is my second time uh, running for US Senate and I'm running against uh, Robert Menendez uh, who is currently under indictment, has been indicted twice for, for political corruption and also for acting as a foreign agent. Uh, and as far as I know, he's still in the race, uh, despite my calls for him to resign. The only thing he's done, and he had to, he had to step down as chair of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, but he's still on the committee and he's still in the Senate. So um, those are some of the highlights. I hope I didn't bore people. No, <laughs> um, you know, I, I remember 
each of the points <laughs> at every point, even though I was in California, I, I was watching everything you were doing. So um, thanks a lot for that. And for people who didn't know you, they just get, you know, they got an idea of what your resume includes. Um, if you could, for explanation, and this going to, uh, goes into my category of civic, so to speak, what is the job description and role of the United States Senator? And what should the public expect? And I guess lastly, why is it so important that we support people running for that position? Well, uh, as a U.S. Senator, I am a member uh, of the United States Senate, which is one of uh, the two houses of the legislative branch of government uh, that we learned in civics, right, about the three branches of government. And um, we have what's called in uh, what's called in political uh, science parlance, a bicameral house. We have two houses in our legislative branch, the House of Representatives uh, uh, and the United States Senators. Now, uh, New Jersey has, I believe, now 12 uh, U.S. Congress people who sit in the House of Representatives, and every state in the nation uh, has two U.S. Senators. So there are 100 members of the United States Senate. And the United States Senate uh, um, provides all the legislation, all the federal legislation, uh, dealing with both the uh, foreign and domestic issues uh, for the country. And um, no bill can become law unless it's passed by both houses, uh, the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. All right. And so, Larry. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead, Bill. I think what would probably be particularly helpful for the people on this call would be to talk about some of your positions on issues that would distinguish your candidacy from Menendez and from the other people who are running. And particularly in light of some of the um, international circumstances that are taking place at the moment. And so if you would just highlight some of those, um, you know, campaign issues that you think would be pertinent for people on the call to know about. Well, first, let me state clearly, I am running as a Democrat. I'm running in the New Jersey Democratic primary, which will be held on June 4th. Uh, I'm, I ran in the Democratic primary in 2020, and I'm running now in the Democratic primary uh, in 2024. Uh, and I think that's important for people to understand. And I want to say this at the beginning so that there's no confusion and people won't say that I uh, uh, deceive them or something. Uh, I'm running as a Democrat. I am planning to be the U.S. Senator. However, I will, if I'm not the U.S. Senator, if I'm not, if I don't win the Democratic primary, I will support the winner of the Democratic primary, just as I will support whoever is the winner of the Democratic primary for president. Uh, and I want to make that clear because I know in some people's minds, you know, people might look at me as, as uh, progressive or uh, 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 left leaning or radical. And I'll take all of those. Yes, I'm that and probably more. But I want to say clearly that this election is so important um, that I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that Donald Trump does not win a second term as president of the United States. And I think uh, that can only happen if he's uh, um, defeated by the strongest possible candidate. So um, people ask me, well, what, what are you running for? What is your platform? I wanna make clear that my platform is the same platform that Martin Luther King had. My platform is the same platform of the Poor People's Movement of 1968. My platform is the same platform that came out of the National Black Political Convention that was held in Gary, Indiana. And by the way, although I, I, I glossed over it uh, in my introduction, 
I was the youngest elected delegate to Gary in 1972. I was 18 years old and I had been elected up through the local black political convention, the statewide black po political convention to the national black political convention. My agenda will be the same as the agenda that Jesse Jackson had in 1988. And the same agenda, many people don't know that the Million Man March was not just a trip to Washington, DC. There was a Million Man March agenda. And if you Google it, you probably can access it. So my agenda is a peace and justice agenda. Um, first and foremost, I want reparations for the descendants of those who were enslaved in the United States of America. Uh, I make no bones about it. Uh, I have been. Um, Pull over if you want. We just got done driving. I'll do this thing. I'll just keep going off. Well, where did it should? Where did it should be? Um, somebody, um, yeah, let me see if I can there. find somebody needs to mute. Let me find out who it is. Thank you. So good. Uh, okay, so um, I I became a cane, acquainted with the issue of reparations when I was working with um, Amiri Baraka in 1971, and especially in 1972, because that was an issue that came up at the National Black Political Convention. I met Queen Mother Moore at the National Black Pol Political Convention uh, in Gary, Indiana. Um, so reparations is uh, number one. Number two, it's the issue of police brutality. See, we have to have a candidate in this race for Senate that's going to talk about the issues and uh, in a priority way that the other candidates are not going to talk about. So reparations and the passes of the reparations legislation, uh, both H.R. 40 in the House and S. 40 in the Senate. Uh, police brutality. We have to have federal legislation to address this issue. If we don't, you know, the issue will continue to get worse. In fact, I don't know how many people are conscious of it, but last year, 2023, more people were killed by the police in the United States than any previous year since they started counting. I mean, can you imagine this? Three, almost four years after the election of George Floyd, the police are actually killing more people than they were when George Floyd was killed in 2020. So reparations, protecting voting rights, is uh, imperative. I mean, there is an all out attack on voting rights, particularly, and, and don't be deceived about it. This is not just an attack on voting rights in general. This is an attack on black people's voting rights. And we see that the Supreme Court uh, has gutted the Voting Rights Act since it was passed in 1965. I mean, it's, it's basically a shell of, of the original legislation. So uh, protecting voting rights. And now we see this attack on uh, black studies in the guise of CRT. Uh, they don't even wanna teach black studies anymore. We were just involved in the struggle at Seton Hall University to try to save the, the little black studies program that they have. Uh, black books are being banned. So we see this attack on uh, black people's voting rights. We see this attack on black education and we see the attack on black people. I, you wouldn't know it. You would think that it's other people who are the greatest victims of white racist violence in the United States of America. Now that's not to say that other groups are not victims of racist attacks and that their issues shouldn't be addressed. But if you check the latest statistics from the FBI, black people are still at the top of the list of the being the victims of racist violence and domestic uh, terrorism, white supremacist domestic terrorism in the United States. I mean, and it's not just down south. Buffalo is not far from New Jersey, Buffalo, New York. White supremacists went in there and killed up, I think killed 10 black people and wounded others. Dylan Roof went into Mother Emanuel down south, killed nine people, 
spared one so and told that person to go tell what happened here. I mean, we're seeing levels of racist violence comparable to, if not exceeding, that which we saw in the 1960s, maybe even the 1950s. It's just not uh, it's just not the Ku Klux Klan anymore. It's it's white supremacists of all stripes, Nazis and neo-Nazis and Confederates and neo-Confederates. This is a very serious problem. Uh, so, you know, those are some of the issues. And of course, there are other issues that, you know, we have to address. Uh, uh, the question of health care. I mean, there are millions of people still, even with the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, there's still millions of people who don't have health insurance, and there are millions of people who uh, have health insurance but still are, are, are carrying medical debt. This is the richest country in the world, the richest. Of the 34 advanced industrial countries in the United States, I mean, uh, the in advanced the industrial countries in the world, we are the only country that does not have universal health care. The only country that doesn't have it, and we should have it. Look at look at our young people. What kind of future do they have when they're graduating for, from college with student debt of $50,000, $100,000 and more just for undergraduate school? Never mind another 150,000, maybe 200,000 for medical school and for law school. We should have free college in this country. And if we can bail out the banks and bail out corporations and send billions of, of dollars abroad for wars, then we can provide a free college education and abolish um, student debt for our young people. And many of our young people now are working in certain places making $7.25 an hour. That's the federal minimum wage. It has not been raised in 13 years. Now, that's the federal minimum wage. What about the federal tipped wage, the wage that people who are waiters and waitresses make? You know what it is? It's $2.15 an hour. That's preposterous. It's outrageous. We should not only have a minimum wage in this country, we should have a living wage in the country. Molly, is your dad still so coming? That, so that every person who works 40 hours a week has enough money to support themselves, support their families, okay, raise drink children. your lemonade. Those are some Thank of the issues. Right, so, so, so let me, let me um, um, please put that. your phones on mute. Please yes. mute yourselves. Deborah yes. Robinson. Okay. So, so I have a quick follow-up question. So different people, different notes have come up in the chat. Um, Two points, and particularly uh, appreciate the clarification about <clears throat> making sure that Trump doesn't get reelected. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of um, dissatisfaction with Biden on two issues that African Americans feel real strong about. One is the student loan debt. And right. so I know that there has been the Supreme Court blocked the student loan debt proposal that he originally made, and he's come up with some modifications so that some debt has been released. And the mm -hmm. second is Gaza. And so, you and know. And the second is what? I didn't hear it. Second, second is, what? Is, is how he's handling the Gaza, the genocide in oh, Gaza. Gaza. Yes. Yes. And so, just curious, uh, particularly since, you know, you said you're going to do everything you can do to support whoever the Senate nominee is and to support Biden will clearly be the Democratic nominee. How do you respond to those concerns that um, people have about those two positions? Well, it's tough because the reality is that a lot of people are dissatisfied with Biden because there, there are promises that were not kept. There were some things that he has done, but there are some things that he hasn't done, and there's a lot of dissatisfaction. And I understand that dissatisfaction. Let me say this. I support people's right to vote or not to vote. I support people's right to vote for whoever they want to vote for. I, su I support people's democratic right to support third party candidates if they choose to do so. 
I support their right to form third parties if they choose to do so. But because I support those rights does not necessarily mean that I see that as the best strategy. The reality is this, that there unfortunately will be one of, of two people who will be president of the United States. It'll either be Donald Trump or it will be Joe Biden. And we have to choose. Now, I know a lot of Arab brothers and sisters are, are saying they're not going to vote. That's their right. And quite frankly, I can understand it because our country under Biden's leadership has been complicit in a genocidal war against the Palestinian people in Gaza. But we also have a war going on in this country. It's a low level war. It's the, the, the war of a fascist threat. We have a full on fascist movement in this country today. Just as fascist as Mussolini, just as fascist as Hitler, just as fascist of, as any of the right wing uh, leaders of some of these European countries right now. And they clearly, the Republican party has clearly become the party of white supremacy under the leadership of the MAGA movement and Donald Trump. We absolutely cannot, cannot let Trump get reelected. He's absolutely shown us who he is. Now, with regard to Biden, there are very big problems. But if, if I have that choice, and this is me speaking, if I have that choice to make I'm going to vote for Biden in November so that Trump can't win. Now, would I prefer to have somebody else? I would have preferred somebody. I had hoped that Cornell West was going to run in the Democratic primary so he could so we could have a ticket. He could run for president and I could run for U.S. Senate. But he, he chose to move in another direction. But Trump has to be defeated with regard to the situation in the Middle East. As early as October, as chairman of the People's Organization for Progress, I issued a statement condemning the war in Gaza. It did not take all of October, all of November, all of December, and all of January for me to come to the conclusion that something was wrong in Gaza. It was clear to me from the beginning that this was a war, a genocidal attack on the Palestinian people. It was not just a war on Hamas. And we can see that all, we can all see that now. So I've issued statements in October, in November, in December, and in January, condemning this war and condemning our role in it. This genocidal war in Gaza has been made possible by the more than $100 billion in US aid that has been given to Israel just for this war. Not to mention the $4 billion that Israel receives every year and has received every year since the end of World War II. The bombs that are being dropped on Gaza were paid for by, the US, by our tax dollars and were bought from U.S. armaments companies. And, you know, it's so ironic. I mentioned that I've been involved in the anti-apartheid movement uh, uh, in uh, 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 as a college student. And isn't it ironic that after Nelson Mandela became president and the racist apartheid regime was uh, removed, that it's South Africa that has taken Israel to the International Court of Justice to sue against the genocide that is going on in Gaza. And isn't it remarkable that this African country was victorious in the International Court of Justice? Israel went in with a, a, a counter suit to have South Africa's uh, suit dismissed in the International Court of Justice with votes of 15 to two and 16 to one said no. We find enough evidence here that there's a case that genocide is plausible 
and that the South African suit against Israel for genocide is going to go forward. And just think about this. If, in fact, South Africa, I mean, if, in fact, Israel is found guilty of genocide, that means the United States, Britain, and Germany, and other European countries may be cited for being complicit in that genocide. So where do I stand? I stand where I stood in 1972. In 1972, at the Gary Black, at the National Black Political Convention in Gary, Indiana, the issue of Palestinian self-determination was on the agenda. It was the day before. I'm not telling you about what I read. I'm <laughs> telling you about where I was and what happened. The day before the convention ended, when we were in the plenary session to ratify the national black political agenda, when we got to the section on international and foreign affairs, we had a platform plank. That platform plank was the national black political convention recognizes the self-determination of the Palestinian people. The Michigan delegation led at that time by Coleman Young, who had not become mayor of Detroit. He was still, I believe in the trade union movement, he threatened to take out the Michigan delegation and destroy the unity of the convention if we were to pass that platform plan. But we did pass it under Amiri Baraka's leadership and his plea to the General Assembly. At the convention at that time, we supported self-determination for the Palestinian people. When I was a student at Princeton University, when Golda Meir came to speak at Princeton University, I was in protest in front of the building where Golda Meir spoke, when the young uh, 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 white American girl, Rachel Corey, laid in front of a bulldozer uh, not too long ago, laid in front yeah. of a bulldozer to keep them from bulldozing Palestinian homes, and the Israelis rolled that bulldozer over her. We protested in Newark against the murder of Rachel Corey. So over the decades, I have supported self-determination for the Palestinian people, and I will continue to support the self-determination for Palestinian people. There must be immediately a permanent ceasefire. We must let humanitarian aid into Gaza, unrestricted, unfettered flow of humanitarian aid. And just check this out, Bill. Just today, just this week, the United States said it was going to put on pause its financial contribution to UNRWA. UNRWA right. is the UN uh, agency, relief agency for the Palestinian people because of an unsubstantiated claim by Israel that 13 of the, un of the 30,000 UNRWA employees were somehow uh, members of Hamas or supporters of Hamas. None of that has been sustained, sub, uh, substantiated. But the United States has put its humanitarian aid on pause. But while the humanitarian aid is on pause, we are sending $17.8 billion this week to Israel to consider the, the to continue the genocidal war. Well, but you certainly clarified your position on that. Now, a little bit more about the student loan question. Oh, well, the, the student, <laughs> I think I made clear my position on the student loans. I, we supported uh, the People's Organization for Progress was founded in 1982. We had 10 core demands. You can look them up. You can Google the 10 core demands of the People's Organization for Progress. The first demand on the list was for reparations for Africans who were the descendants of those enslaved in the United States. And among those 10 core demands was free college education. We've always demanded that. And uh, when that's the reason I supported Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders was the only presidential candidate who was calling for free college 
and who was calling for the abolition of student debt. Before the convention, none of them were calling for that. None of the other presidential candidates in 16 were calling for that. They finally got around to that during the presidential, after the presidential primary and the Democratic uh, uh, National Convention of 2016. So I've long supported the idea that college should be free. Why should college be free? Because college was free. SCUNY was free. CCNY was free. College was free mm -hmm. in, in California until Ronald Reagan was elected president. You know, this idea about free college, this is not some new idea or some idea that came from the uh, 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 some fringe organization, some fringe group. The idea that college should be free and healthcare should be free. These are old ideas in modern democratic societies. The United States, although we are the richest country in the world, we are the most socially backward democratic country. Because in Germany, they have free college. In Israel, we sending money to Israel, $17 billion, $100 billion for war. Israel has free college. Israel has free health care. But our children here don't have free college and free health care. And I'm telling you, even if I support Joe Biden, not if, even, even when I support Joe Biden, if he, if, if he is in fact wins the Democratic primary for president, I'm going to hold him accountable. He must be held accountable. You know, it's possible to do two things at one time. Yes, I might vote for him, but I'm going to hold him accountable for this and more, you know, as we as we go forward. So so one one question for switch back over to Linda. What can people on the call do to help your campaign? Brother they can do everything <laughs> <laughs> to help my campaign. Yes, sir. They're fundamentally, yes, sir. They're, they're fundamentally two things that they can do immediately and that are needed immediately. First, I must get on the ballot. To get on the ballot for the Democratic primary, June 4th, I have to get the signatures of 1,000 registered voters who are Democrats. They have to be Democrats because this is the Democratic primary. So people could help people. Number one, people could sign a petition. We have petitions in circulation. People could sign a petition. But what would be more helpful if people would volunteer and take a petition and get the signatures uh, on the petition? So getting signatures, signing a petition and getting signatures on a petition uh, is one practical thing that people can do. The second thing is we need money. Uh, it's unfortunate, but our political process, our political system is driven by money. It was always driven by money, but we're in a hyper financialized state now because of court decisions like Citizens United. It wasn't just Citizens United. It's been a series of court decisions over the last four decades that have given an increasing power to money in our elections. And Citizens United uh, was the apex of that, which essentially said money is free speech and uh, people can give as much money as they want to candidates. So one of the things I want to do if I when I'm elected a uh, senator uh, from New Jersey is to sponsor or co-sponsor and support legislation to reverse the Supreme Court uh, decision in the Citizens United case. We have to if we don't take money out of our elections, our elections will be bought and sold by the uber rich, the super wealthy. You know, it'll be important possible for regular people to get elected to office. So so one thing is to sign petitions, get petitions signed. And the second thing is to make a contribution to my campaign. Uh, they can do that by going to our website at Lawrence Ham for Senate. Uh, Lawrence Ham, one word, 
the number four, not the word four, number four, senate.info. If you go there, you will uh, see uh, the link that can take you to our Act Blue account so that people can make uh, financial donations. You know, I'm going to tell you the truth. Um, <laughs> I hate the fact that I have to beg people for money to run for election. I really do. I don't like to do it. I hate it to the point where my own campaign workers have to tell me, now you can't be making speeches and not ask people for money. I hate to ask people for money, but the truth of the matter is you can't win these campaigns without money. And and uh, we were talking before the show started and I think uh, Sister Higginbottom was making some very important uh, remarks and I, I've seen comments in the chat and uh, heard other comments by people. If we are to chart a more independent political course, we're going to have to finance it. There's not, and 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 that financing is going to be, you know, uh, very very significant, you know, because of the way our political system is structured. You know, if you don't have money. You you really can't win. And uh, so please, if you can, uh, go to lawrenceham4senate.info, make a contribution. If you can, make that recurring contribution. Check that box, too. Uh, and your help will be greatly appreciated. You can also reach our campaign at 973-332-6195, uh, 973-332-6195. Uh, Larry, that after uh, uh, Valerie has placed that information on the chat for people to take a look at. Um, I thank God for Valerie Dale. Do y'all know who Valerie Dale is? She is the sister of Major Gulia Dale, who was a 42-year career veteran, a survivor of both wars in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan only to return home to his town of Newton, New Jersey and be killed on the 4th of July. That's how I met Valerie Dale. And Valerie has taken the grief to, to this day, Valerie can't talk. We have these rallies against police brutality, Bob does. And we invite the family members of the victims who've been killed by the police to speak. Valerie can't speak without tears coming to her eyes, even though her brother has been dead for more than two years. But she has taken her grief mm -hmm. and turned it into strength. And she is one of the most active working members of the People's Organization for Progress which is an all volunteer organization. And she's one of the most active, hardworking members of my political campaign. And I just, I can't say thank you enough uh, to Valerie for all that she has done. And we're gonna continue fighting for justice for her brother. Uh, just a couple of things. One is that we don't wanna assume people know what fascism is and I think it's important, especially in light of the fact that Trump's pretty much telling us what he's going to do. But a lot of people That's hear right. that, and, and both you and I know that this is not new to America. We've been on our way right. for a while. He's just accelerating it. So if you would just give a quick definition that people can understand about what fascism is, because it has a lot to do with the I call it the neoliberal capitalist system that evolved from Reagan and probably beforehand. Um, so if you could right. just do that quickly. Right. You know, there are a number of definitions of fasc fascism. And I want to try to give the simplest and clearest way for people to understand what fascism is. If this is democracy, fascism is anti-democracy. That's really the, the fundamental difference. Fascist is the rule of the most extreme, um, the most extreme members of the right wing of the political elite in a country. I mean, there are more formal definitions that says, uh, I mean, like the classical definition is the 
is the merger of the government class, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I really don't think that gives a clearer picture in people's minds. You know, democracy is ruled through elections. Fascism is ruled through dictatorship or ruled through oligopoly, which is a minority uh, of people. So it's really anti-democracy. And um, fascism didn't start in Germany. Fascism started in Italy. As quiet as it's kept, Adolf Hitler was a student of Benito Mussolini. Mm -hmm. And it is one of those examples where the student exceeds the master because fascism became stronger in Germany than it was in Italy. In fact, Hitler had to come to Mussolini's rescue. But do you know what one of the origins of fascism is? It's slavery in the United States. If you read my, if you read both the writings of Mussolini and the writings of Hitler, they both spoke in glowing terms mm -hmm. of the <clears throat> racial arrangement in the United States, of the racist laws. They saw the laws of racial segregation in the United States as a model for what they wanted to do in Italy and in Germany. In fact, the uh, 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 fascists took the whole system of Native American reservations in the United States. That was the model for the Bantu system in South Africa, believe it or not. I know it's hard to believe. I know a lot of this stuff when I first came to it was hard for me to wrap my head around. I'm like, I, how come they never told us this? in high school how come you know but if you read you you find out but the the fascists in south africa the white minority rule fascists in south africa use the system of american reservations as a model so you know and it has a long history as a uh, professor uh linda carter said it, uh fascism has a and fascism is as old in the united states as fashion fascism is old in the 1930s the fascists used to march up and down Fifth Avenue in New York City. They used to have huge rallies in Madison Square Garden with huge pictures of George Washington on one side of the stage and Adolf Hitler on the other side of the stage. There was one group of fascists called the Silver Shirts. They bombed the Picatinny, um, Picatinny Arsenal right here in New Jersey. My mother worked at Picatinny Arsenal in the 50s when they bombed the Picatinny Arsenal. So fascism has um, a history uh, in this country and, it, and its most recent manifestation is this uh, right wing, uh, extreme right wing uh, MAGA movement led by Donald Trump. And make no mistake, even if we defeat Trump, and that's not a given, isn't it amazing? Here's a guy that's been indicted four times, facing 91 counts, got multiple trials, and he's now the leading contender, according to the polls, for president Seriously. of the United States. But even if we defeat Trump in November, we will not have defeated the movement, the fascist movement, and that struggle will have to continue. Yeah, uh, just a quick note for people to check out Heritage 2025. It's about 75, including the, Her including the Heritage Foundation, where they have putting together a game plan for 2025. Um, and it's not Trump, it's Trumpism, because they really don't care about him. It's just the concept. So moving right along, because we want to be able to take some questions. I do have a question real quick about your position on women's health care and reproductive rights. If you can give us um, a quick sum and answer yes. your question. Uh, in short, I absolutely support women's right to a safe and legal abortion. I mean, I have spoken at rallies that women have had. To, that is my position, and that's the position of the People's Organization for Progress. We support uh, women's reproductive rights. I think it is an abomination that in black communities in the United States, we have infant mortality and maternal mortality rates higher than those in some African countries. This is an abomination. 
And it's a direct relationship uh, between that and institutional racism, particularly institutional racism that exists in our healthcare system. And the fact that we have a healthcare system that's driven by profit and not based on the human right of human beings to healthcare. I mean, how is it that we can send, do you know what the cost of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were? Maybe six to eight trillion dollars. We got six to eight trillion dollars for wars that we did not win. Somebody tell me what we gained from Iraq and what we gained from Afghanistan. But how many hospitals have we closed? We've closed more than 30 hospitals in New Jersey. Most of them were in black and brown communities in the last 25 years. I mean, in Newark alone, we closed St. James Hospital, Columbus Hospital, uh, uh, Children's Hospital, uh, which was Presbyterian Hospital, Irvington General Hospital, Orange Memorial Hospital, Muhlenberg Hospital in in um Rainfield, New Jersey, and in a lot of cases that that that's not half the story. In a lot of cases, these communities just didn't lose hospitals. In many cases, these hospitals were the largest employers of residents in those mm -hmm. towns. So it was a a, a double indemnity, a, 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 a double hit that, that these towns took. Why are we closing hospitals? You know, I would put forward legislation that we not close any more hospitals, that we set up a fund to keep hospitals that are in financial trouble, keep them open. We shouldn't close one more hospital in the United States of America. And we need universal health care. We need to take Medicare, which I'm on, and expand it so that everybody has Medicare. Okay. Um, this one goes to uh, after the election, but before. Someone said something about Biden and, and the um, we need to remember and keep in mind when evaluating Biden. But that's uh, what I'm going to ask you kind of comes from that. Uh, mm -hmm. What do we do to ensure that your commitment to to the public is sustained. Like, how do we hold your feet to the fire? What I said to the gentleman who sent it in, we need to get commitments first <laughs> about what you're gonna do so we can see how we're gonna hold you to the fire, you know, from this point on. So can you speak to that? Yes, yes. Now, this is a very important question. And I hope that sometime in the future, you will let me come back so that we can have a discussion, not so I can just talk and talk and talk, so that we can actually have a discussion on the mechanics of political accountability. See, political keeping an elected official accountable is not just a matter of, of cussing that person out. Although, if you don't have nothing else, <laughs> you, you cussing <laughs> out might be your only tool. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you, some of these people don't like to be cussed out and are very embarrassed when they're cussed out. But there are other things that must be done. I mean, why is it that 80 percent of the American people want a permanent ceasefire? But our government will not provide, will not do anything to enact a permanent ceasefire. Our government could do that. Do you know that when Menachem Begin wanted to invade Lebanon, George H.W. Bush called him up and said, if you invade Lebanon, I'm going to cut off military aid to Israel. The invasion didn't happen. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen. You know, I mean, why is it our government, the people are going in one direction and the government is going up because lobbying groups like APAC are putting hundreds of thousands of dollars in the political representatives that are many times are in the districts that we're in. And they listen more to the people who are giving them $300,000 and $500,000 for their PAC, their political action committee, 
than they do to their constituents. So if you want to hold me accountable, I, I invite people to hold me accountable. You'll be able to hold me accountable. You hold the, how you hold a politician accountable. First of all, you have to continue to keep them under the microscope mm -hmm. and see how they're voting. Most of us cannot even say, I, I dare somebody on this call to tell me how their political representative voted on three important issues. Most of us can't, you know, we guess. We guess that, well, they were a Democrat, they must have voted yes, you know, for this or, yeah, or no against that. No, we, 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 don't, we don't get down to the granular level where we look at their voting record, what they actually voted for. You know, like some of these Republicans, right? You know what they do? They condemn Biden infrastructure bill, and then they go out to their district and say, <laughs> I brought $4 million to fix this bridge. When in fact they voted against the bill that provided the million dollars for the for the bridge, so we have to look at our candidates' voting record, uh, our our elected representatives' voting record. We have to make those public. We have see being a federal representative like a congressman or a senator, you know, is a little different because if if you're a city councilman, or if you're a commissioner on the county board of commissioners. You got to have monthly meetings where the citizens can come and go to town if they have to about how you voted. But there's the only place you can go, you know, for the congressman is go to their office, to the senator, their office. You know, if I'm elected, I will have town hall meetings where the people can come and directly confront me if, in fact, I voted in a way that is contrary to the interests of our community. So having meetings with the constituents, having public meetings, making my voting record public. And then, you know, if I'm found wanting, as they say in the Bible, vote me out. You know, vote me out. Uh, just the last thing before we move on to questions. And well, two things. One, I just want to announce for people who want to know, especially for federal uh, at the federal level, you can go to openrecords.org to see people's, not only see their record, you can see where their money is coming from. We have some people in the Congressional Black Caucus who've gotten like almost a half a million dollars from, from Jewish groups that are supporting Israel. So, you know, you can go to openrecords.org and check that out. Uh, the other thing before, Helen had a question. Helen, the question had to do- It was oh, about black male voters. Black, black, and, yeah. And so- Go ahead. So let, let, me, let me expand on that a little bit, Larry. So there's, you know, the perception or misinformation or could be accurate that black black women have been like 90 plus percent Democratic voters. And so the black males are supposedly peeling off to support Trump or other Republicans. But I think that connected to that question for me is um, the work that the Institute for Social Justice has done, which highlights the disparities in New Jersey for black people. So we have the highest disproportionate rate of black male incarceration. We have the highest disproportionate rate of black to white wealth gap. We have, right. you know, the maternity issue, which you addressed earlier. We have one of the highest mortality rates for black women in the country. I mean, so there's some very pressing issues for black people in New Jersey, which paradoxically, since it's a blue state, since we have a democratic governor, since we have Democrats in, you know, to control the state legislature, then it would seem as though that you know, and black folks got Murphy in the second time, right? Over 90% of black people voted to support Murphy. And so I think that, you know, thinking about black male voters as a cohort, but also thinking about these issues that affect black people in New Jersey, just to give some perspective on those things before we entertain questions of people on the call. Well, first of all, as, <laughs> as someone who has, um, uh, been a leader in grassroots organizations, the role that Black women play are invaluable. And I should say the historical role, because this is not new. This was the reality during the civil rights movement that in many cases, the brothers is out front doing the talking and the sisters, uh, you know, doing the work of actually uh, getting the movement going 
and keeping the movement going. So yes, black women have had a very high voting rate. There's no, no disputing this. I mean, in, in uh, 2020, that was the Biden-Trump election. You know, that was the highest voter turnout in the history of the United States. Yep. Uh, Biden got 81 million. Trump got 76 million. Biden was the highest vote getter in the history of a presidential election. And Trump was the second highest vote getter in the history scary of presidential elections. It's a scary thought, right? Scary I mean, thought. think about that. That there was 70, and this is also to understand this whole thing about fascism. Fascism has a popular base. It, mm -hmm. Trump ain't out here. He's no magician. He, not, he don't have no magical power over people. There are a lot of millions of people who are in unity with that racist right-wing agenda that they have. But it was a super high voter turnout, the highest in the, in the, in the nation's history. People came out. Black women voted 95% for the Democrat, Joe Biden. No other group had as high, when I say groups, I'm talking about uh, women, uh, talking about Latinos, Asians, Indian Americans, and on and on, all the ways that you can cut the population pie. They had the highest rate, voter rate, for the Democratic candidate, Joe Biden. But guess who had the second highest rate? Black men. Black men. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and this and and see, we got to be careful not to fall in the trick bag because stereotypical thinking will tell you that black women were like way up here at ninety five percent, and black men was down there, and half of black men voted for Trump. No, black women were ninety five percent for Biden. Black men were eighty five percent for Biden. No other group. Hispanics or anybody else, women, anybody else had as high a voting rate or had, I should say, had a higher voting rate than black men. Black men were only behind black women. And we have to be very careful not to fall into the trick bag where some people see it in their interest to play black men off against black women and black women off against black men. What we need is black unity of all of us because all of us are catching hell you know and this whole thing is nothing but another divide and conquer ploy turn the women against the men and the men against the women i mean that's one of the most fundamental divisions that you could make you know if you want to conquer people we need black unity we need that kind of unity we had during the black power movement when we were moved some of us are old enough to remember that I lived through that. You lived through it, Bill, and other mm -hmm. people lived through it. So I'll just leave that there and say, uh, yes, Black women had the highest voting rate, but Black men had the second highest voting rate uh, for the Democratic candidate. And I believe it will be the same because everything that I'm hearing now, how despondent people are, and people have reason. I'm not saying their reasons are not valid. Yes, many people are despondent. They're not inspired uh, uh, by this election. Uh, uh, that That's all true. But I heard all of that in 20, all of it, that there was going to be this huge defection of black voters to Donald Trump. Uh, he had to, he had a handful of black ministers up there with him, praying on him. One of them is getting ready to go to jail, you know? And I think this is, this is all part of a kind of similar scenario, but we shouldn't go for the okie doke. It's we need black Trump mind, The Trump megalomine trick, you know, so yes. we, we need it. <laughs> yes. So, uh, Helen, I hope that we can, you know, start to entertain. I've seen a lot of comments in the chat. I'm sure there are people who want to engage with candidate Ham and, you know, hear some of his insights on different questions and topics that we didn't raise. And so yeah. if you want to invite people to do that. Absolutely. Um, I thought I saw Charles. What's his last name? He had his hand. Um, help me, Linda. Charles Upshaw. Yes, yeah, Charles, Charles Upshaw. Upshaw. 
Hi, Charles. Hi, Charles. And for those of you who have questions, please um, either raise your hand electronically so that we can get you in the order that we see your hands. Thank you. And all questions are welcome. Um, Go ahead, um, Mr. Yeah, uh, I just want to say that um, the other day I was in uh, Five Guys Burgers and Fries and uh, said to a young man that was working there, he seemed like he was in his 20s. And I asked him, I said, you know, are you uh, registered to vote? I said, this is a very important election that's coming up. And uh, his response was, no, I'm not registered to vote because um, whoever you vote for, they're not going to do anything for me. And it seems that, you know, a lot of uh, young, you know, people in our communities are, you know, a little uh, disenfranchised with the uh, um, politics and, and, and the outcome of, uh, of these elections. And I just want to know, like, um, what's the plan to get connected to more of these young people who are not uh, uh, registered? Or, and if they're registered, they're not voting. Well, we are reaching out uh, to the young people, uh, especially those on the college campuses. In fact, I was with Bell Davis on uh, was that was that Friday, Bill? Friday. We were to get huh? Friday. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, at Rutgers University uh, for the um, opening Black History program, one of the opening Black History programs that we had that they had. Uh, so I am trying to get onto college campuses and speak to college students. Uh, I'm trying to reach out to the youth. It, it's a tough road. I ain't going to lie about it. what you encountered with that young man. I have encountered the same thing. Keep in mind that a minute ago I said that in 2020 we had the largest turnout, voter turnout uh, in history in a presidential election. But despite that record turnout, there was still 80 million eligible voters that did not participate in the election. 80 million eligible voters that did not participate. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be tough, but we have to reach out to the youth. And there are a lot of young people, there are a lot of young people that are turned off, but there are also some young people who are turned on, and they're also some young people who are open they're not necessarily politically active but you know they can be reached and they can be talked to i mean by going to bill's program uh well not bill's program but the black history program on friday night uh i was able to make contact with and get some of the a few of the young people to get involved in my campaign so it's a matter of, of reaching out going where the young people are and trying to get them involved but this is a task not just for elections, brothers and sisters. Yeah. This is a task for our movement. We're not going to have it. If you go to a lot of these meetings, including the People's Organization for Progress, you're going to see a lot of people as old as I am. Now, I'm 70, but I ain't finished fighting yet. Just because you're <laughs> up in age, that don't mean you can't fight. In fact, I'm freer now, retired, than I was you know, three years ago when I was still employed. <laughs> But we're not going to have a future to our movement if we don't get the young people, the Black, Latino, and other young people involved. Not only was I at um, the Black History Program at Rutgers, I was invited by the students to speak at a Free Palestine rally. About 150 to 200 students rally rallied on Brower Commons. Uh, and they invited me down there to speak. And more of these young people are inviting me to speak at their um, uh, uh, protests against the genocidal war in Gaza. And I'm going there and as much as I can talk about the campaign and the need for them to be politically active. And, I, and just to, just to follow, a, just to finish, uh, I, I would just like to say that, uh, you know, if uh, you could supply uh, a message that we can, you know, utilize uh, to answer the question for these Young people, why it's important for them to vote, uh, that would be, you know, very helpful. Thank you. I will and try I to put ask, such a message I, together. I was going to ask, um, Larry, is there, um, mm -hmm. first of all, let's all uh, pay respects for a moment to the loss of uh, a political giant in our community. We lost Joe Madison this yes. week. 
Um, yeah, he was a very important voice for us to have during this political season. And one of the things that Joe Madison and others in the country talked about a lot is engaging high school students, right? Because, you know, um, high school students are 17, graduating in 18 in November and ready to vote. Um, and I know that Newark has just decided that I think 16 year olds can vote yeah. in the um, school, board. school board elections. In the school board elections. So yeah. I my question is: Is there are there any efforts toward getting um, high school kids engaged? Because when you look at the two constituent groups that are most upset about this whole thing that's happening in Gaza, black people are up there, but so are young people. Young people are yes. not feeling um, America's involvement in supporting genocide. So yes. I hope that there are some efforts in your campaign to tap into, get those kids energized. And even some of them by the primary in June might be old enough to vote. So I'm just wondering if there's any efforts in your camp to do that. Well, I, I'm not going to lie. I need help in that area. And if there are any folks in this audience who can get me onto a college campus, who can get me into a high school, I told my folks today in our campaign meeting, we have a campaign meeting, a Zoom campaign meeting every Sunday at one o'clock. I told them today, y'all not working me hard enough. I, there shouldn't be a day go by that I don't have five places to go and speak. So if any people on this call, on this Zoom, can get me into a high school, you know, and, and and it doesn't necessarily have to be come in on the campaign because, you know, you can't do partisan campaigning in, in these public schools, but you can invite me in for Black History Month, you know, all this month. You can invite me in to talk about the, I was the youngest school board member in the history of the United States. Who better to bring in to talk about getting young people involved and talk about how I got into that position because of student activism at that time. So yes, I'm trying to reach out, but if there are those of you who have contact, I mean, if you don't, if you're not there in those places, those spaces yourself, if you have contacts with people say, hey, get Larry Ham to come in and talk to the young people about the importance of political participation, you know, or, uh, and, and so forth. Okay, I see. Thank you, uh, Mr. Upshaw. Appreciate your question. Uh, Ms. Muhammad, I see your hand is raised. Good evening. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Good evening. Okay, good. Um, good evening, Brother Larry Ham. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to learn more about your campaign. I actually have two questions. So we know that all politics are equal. And I'm, I'm sorry, are local. And the fact is, the only way that we can get you into the you elected into the U.S. Senate is for New Jerseyans to show up at the polls. Right. There's a problem. New Jersey still continues to have this problematic county line ballot system, yes. and it yes. confuses elders. It confuses people with disabilities who are registered voters. It confuses everyone. So, right. how do you advise your supporter your supporters to show up at the ballot? and find you on the ballot? Oh. Well, well, uh, let me say that this, the, 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 the county line, so to speak, and the way ballots are configured in New Jersey uh, have been a bone of contention for some time. Uh, New Jersey's ballots are unlike ballots in most of the other states. And uh, they are configured that way because it helps benefit whatever political power is, uh, whatever political party is in power in that particular county. If people want to see a more democratic uh, ballot selection process or, or ballot drawing process, then they should support uh, the lawsuits, there are some lawsuits underway right now uh, 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 against the county line configuration. Uh, my belief, though, is, is that these lawsuits won't be resolved before January 4th and may not be resolved before November election. And even if they are resolved, it may be too late 
uh, for, for the current elections going on. But we should always look to make our democratic process more democratic, you know, with the small d, not the, not the democratic party, but the democratic process more democratic. And certainly abolishing these county line uh, configured ballots would be one way to do that. And I and I support that. I, the People's Organization for Progress, we have been part of coalitions uh, supporting that. There are a number of things that should be done, not only uh, reconfiguring ballots, but also we should have same day voter registration in New Jersey and in the country. I mean, with all this technology we have today, why are we still using 19th century voting methods? I mean, really, that that's that's what it is. I mean, if a person is not registered to vote, why can't they register on the day of the election and just vote? I mean, all the technology is there to make that happen. You know, we should have same day voter registration. I mean, really, do you know in some of the European countries, they don't even know what voter registration is. You're born, you get a social security number or so or or number like social security number, and that's it. There's no registering and re-registering. All of these things that they have put into the mix pertaining to voting is really to keep people from participating. We have one of the lowest rates of voter participation with people coming out to school board meetings with a 3% participation rate of, of, of most of the industrial industrialized countries. We have one of the lowest rates of voter participation. Why? Not just because of people's attitude, but because apathy is structured. You know why we had such a big voter participation in New Jersey? Because of the pandemic, we had mail-in ballots. Everybody got one in the mail. You filled it out and you took it to a drop box somewhere and that was it. Everybody got a ballot. And so the voter participation rate shot up. That's ended. Now that COVID is over, we're going back to the old thing. But we must make the democratic process more democratic. You know, I mean, you know, like, and I, I don't want to go on, but I do need to mention this. In most counties, they have what's called roll purging. Like when they send out the, the sample ballots, sample ballots are returned to them in the mail because they didn't reach the people they were supposed to reach. And those people are automatically struck from the ballot. So it's almost like a, a water level in a bucket. Up here, we're registering people and registering people and registering people. But on the bottom, there's a hole in the bucket where people are being taken off the roll, taken off the roll, taken off the roll. I think we have to do away with roll purging and develop a system that keeps every person on the voting rolls so that they can exercise their right to vote. I don't ever want that, Mr. Thank Ham. You. you know that. The Ms. fewer Ms. I Helen? vote, the, the better. Ms. Helen, may I ask my second question? Is there time? Oh, yes, go ahead. Thank you so much, and thank you for your response. I appreciate it. So we've also heard you loud and clear um, our hope is that you are not only the candidate, but you are our next New Jersey um, U.S. Senator from the state of New Jersey. Um, but you stated that you would support um, the candidate who is chosen by this democratic process. Yes. And we know that for, gener for generations, Black and Black people specifically, we've chosen the lesser of two evils. We've chosen the yes. devil that we know. Yes. So how do we hold President Biden and other legislators accountable for their egregious decisions and broken promises um, after Black people have shown up for them at the polls? Well, one of the things we got to do is what all these young people are doing now on Gaza. Why is it only the young people that are demonstrating? Where's the rest of the, the adult population, the voting age population? Where's, where's the Muslim community in New Jersey on this issue? Now, I don't know everything. Maybe the Muslim 
when, when I say the Muslim community now, I'm talking about the black Muslim community. Because I, I was at a mosque in Somerset mm -hmm. where, where um what what's the brother's name, uh, Professor Carter, uh, mm -hmm. the writer? Oh, yeah. Oh, um, Chris Hedges. Chris Hedges. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, yeah, that was, that, was, that was a profound <laughs> presentation. That was a profound yeah. presentation. Yes, I was at that forum where Chris Hedges spoke. I was invited by people from the mosque to attend. I, it was a huge mosque. I didn't even know about this mosque mm -hmm. down there in Somerset, New Jersey. So, you know, you see at these demonstrations, the Arab American and Palestinian Muslims and East Asian Muslims, they're, they're there. Where, where is the black Muslim community? Maybe they're there. Maybe I just don't see them. I, I know, in fact, just like people say about where's your position? I know I done already issued four statements on God's, and because they didn't see it, they thought I didn't issue it. But I'm just asking the question. Like, I think one of the worst things that has happened, and, and it's not really, you know, I don't see it the way everybody else sees it. Because I see things in a more systemic way. People are not just apathetic because they want to be apathetic. You know, they are they are apathetic because number one, why would you continue to participate in a political system that constantly moves against your own interests? I mean, don't you know there have been studies from Princeton, Yale, and Stanford that show our political system functions antithetically to the interests of the people, of the majority of people, you know? But the point I'm trying to make is one of the ways we hold them accountable is to continue to protest. We have to continue to protest. Another way, we have to run candidates in the primaries. That's why I'm running. Because the conventional Democratic Party candidates the establishment Democratic Party candidates are not going to either address these issues that we're concerned about, or they're not going to address them with the level of intensity that we would address them. The fact, the truth of the matter is that there are differences among Democrats. They are right-wing Democrats, they are centrist Democrats, and they're left-wing Democrats. You know, and the way to hold, see, my disappointment in 2020 is that we didn't have a, we didn't have Bernie Sanders or a Bernie Sanders type candidate running for president. The only way we advance our agenda is if we're in the mix. Because with only establishment and conventional candidates in the mix, you're going to get the same old middle of the road stuff. You know, and there has to be a break because humanity is facing an existential crisis. There are two fundamental crises right now that hang like the sword of Damocles over our heads. One is climate catastrophe and the other one is nuclear war. And Biden's actions, the actions of the administration right now, when a genocidal war is taking place, they're going to go in and bomb 85 places one day and bomb so many more the next day. We're going to set the whole region on fire. And, you know, Pakistan is right next, is in the area, and Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Hell, Israel has nuclear weapons. And some of the people in Netanyahu's ca uh, uh, cabinet have said that they should drop a nuclear bomb on Gaza. This is a fact. This is not hyperbole. This is not me exaggerating. So facing this crisis, we need a level of participation that, that like we had during the 60s. We got to step out there. We got to step out there. Now, everybody can't do it the same way, you know, and everybody, you know, we, we all have different gifts and different inclinations and different abilities, but everybody got to find a way. I remember hearing that speech that Dr. King gave at the armory, uh, the 187th Street Armory back in 19, 
uh, 64, when he got back uh, from Oslo, he said the civil rights movement was a movement from which there could be no conscientious objectors. Mm -hmm. Everybody had to be in that movement. And we need that today. We need that same kind of commitment today. You know, because we're on the verge of, of, you can see it. You can look at the weather. Everybody knows something is happening. <laughs> they know they know the thing ain't right, you know? So anyway. Larry, I would just add for the nuclear, potential nuclear annihilation, there are people who actually think they can set off a small nuclear weapon. That's yes. how serious this is and be yes. successful in it. Yes. Trump, Trump we're talking included. about limited nuclear weapons on the battlefield now. Yeah. You know, but go ahead. So let's have another question. I'm, yeah, I'm we sorry. have um, two more questions, but I want to interject real quickly because I I'm sure that you won't, but I will. Um, and you don't even have to speak on it. I just want people on this call to recognize that one of the other candidates in this race is the governor's wife, which I yeah. find an absolute conflict of interest and absolute insult to New Jerseyans everywhere out of the whole state. You mean to tell me this is the best you can do? And it, to me, is another sign of how to um, how out of touch the Democratic Party is. Um, people are tired of this, you know, husband wife thing. We there's nothing that says that we're interested in that, whether it's in New Jersey or anywhere else. And I think that you all should know that this woman, until very recently, was a Republican. She conveniently became a Democrat when it, her husband announced candidacy for governor. And I also want you to understand when you're being uh, manipulated. Uh, not to say that she is not con um, concerned about infant mortality, but what woman is most affected by infant mortality than the Black woman? And what right. woman is more likely to show up and vote other than the Black woman? So That's all right. I'm saying, people, is... Um, I, I think that this is an opportunity for us as a people. We keep saying we're sick and tired and sick and tired and we feel unrepresented. We don't feel if we have power, we have power at the polls. And I hope that everybody on this call, um, and I, I would love to know how many of you were not even aware of Larry Ham's candidacy. I saw that, you know, this past week there was a um a, a debate in Hunterton County. He was not even invited. Um, there was another article that was, um, I think, in the New York Times or some one of the major papers, no mention of Larry Ham, which to me is an insult to us as Black people. The Democrats know that there is no winning an election without us, yet time and time and time again, they disrespect us. And when we try and tell them how, everybody has amnesia. They don't know why. They don't know how. These are the kinds of things that happen. And I certainly hope that Mr. Ham is the successful candidate in New Jersey, but I hope that you all will not be hoodwinked into voting for a woman who has zero, zero political experience. And I guess assumes that just because she's the governor's wife, she'll be a great candidate. I don't know Tammy Murphy from a can of paint before they ever even announced, um, you know, when they just made mention that she was going to be running, I was immediately insulted by the mere insinuation. And I didn't even know what her political history was or that she has no political experience. Uh, we've had enough of that. We need real people. There are real people in the state of New Jersey who have been involved in politics. And whether it's Mr. Ham or somebody else, let's not be bamboozled. On that note, that was uh, when that was my commentary. You don't have to say a word, Mr. Man, Ham. You, you but, need to post that. Somebody need to take what she just take her speech just now and put it online. That's a PSA right there. It's ridiculous. I may write an editorial. I used to write a lot. I need to get back to it. So anyway, I don't even want, you know, you I can we can say things that maybe you can't, and I don't have to be politically correct or I'm I'm not I could care less, right? Um, so anyway, on to the next question from Mr. <laughs> Dre. We're ready for your question, please. Yes, uh, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, uh, Mr. Ham. I would just like to say this to you, Mr. Ham. Um, I've admired all the work that you've done um in New Jersey, across New Jersey for um black people. Um, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I think many, many, many years ago, I think I even had a brief membership in People's Organization for Progress um, when I, I was living in New York. I think and you so, did. 
<laughs> yes. And so, um, Mr. Ham, this is what I'd like to ask you. And these are just two hypotheticals. And mm -hmm. one is, if I told you that as a black man that I plan to vote for Trump, how would you dissuade me against doing so? That's number one. And then number two is, as a black man, if I told you that I did not plan to vote in the general election or even the um, the primary election, um, how what would you say to me to get me to vote? Well, it depends. Um, let me see. Your first one was if you told me you were going to vote for Trump. For Trump, yes. And that I would have a discussion with you, which I would not let evolve okay. into an argument. Because um, at, at this point, after four years of Trump in office and four years of Trump, fighting to stay out of jail if you still could not see how Trump was antithetical to your interests, I, I wouldn't invest a whole lot in terms of arguing with you uh, uh, to try to force you or, or try to dissuade you from voting for Trump and to vote in another direction. But I would have a discussion with you. And I would ask you why um, you would vote for someone who gave solace and support to white supremacists, terrorists. Why, why as the black man would you vote for someone like that? And I would explain to you that this is not new. I mean, if we read, I mean, I don't know what religion you are, but I'm just picking something out of the air here. If, if, if you read the Old Testament, you read, I think it's in, in, in um, Kings, about Dathan, who was himself a Jew, but who in fact tried to dissuade the children of Israel to, to leave uh, and try to go back to Pharaoh. <laughs> you know, I mean, we have that character in Django, you know, that uh, uh, wept when the master died. You know, I, I try to make a case to you as to why would you vote for someone who has a demonstrable record of being opposed to your very being, who represents a movement that in fact wants to undo all the things that we have fought for in the last 60 years. You know, since 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 Brown versus Board of Education, there's a super majority on the Supreme Court now. Six ultra conservative right wing judges on the nine member Supreme Court. Three of them, half of that super majority was appointed by Donald Trump. And that majority on the court has ruled in cases that have uh have had negative implications for voting rights, for women's rights, for labor rights, for consumer rights, uh, for everyone's right. Right now, they're getting ready to argue a case that could result in um, the Supreme Court becoming the Supreme Court and not experts from government departments becoming the final arbiters on uh, government regulation government regulation of the environment, government regulation of the workplace, and so on and so forth. So that's how I, I would I would argue, but I, that's how I would debate with you, but I wouldn't let it, it um, I wouldn't let it escalate to an argument because I think at a certain point, people are emote, when people are emotionally committed to something, and when I say emotionally committed, that their commitment defies logic. Like logic would, demand that you vote for someone who in fact would support your interests. But if you are emotionally committed, you, you know, really don't care. You know, there's something else about Trump you like, you know, and that you're going to vote for him no matter what anyone says. And what was the second question you had? The second part. About a young person. 
Uh, and what was Dre? Uh, he said, to get a I think the, to Dre, what was the part two of your question? I think it was um, somebody who says they're not I, going to vote at all. Right. right. If I told you that as a black man, I do not plan to vote at all. What would you say to me in that instance? Well, you know, uh, as a black man, I mean, I would ask you, do you want a better life for your children? See, I come from 527 South 12th Street in Newark, New Jersey, the heart of the Central War. Before that, I lived at number five Ridgewood Avenue, also the heart of the Central War. My mother was a seamstress in the dry cleaners around the corner from our house for 18 years. I don't think she made more than a few thousand dollars a year. My father was a truck driver. He drove Mack trucks. And he died when I was four years old. I came from a poor black family. I ended up going to Princeton University. Could my people afford to send me to Princeton University? Hell no. How did I get into Princeton University? More than anyone else, I am aware that I am at this university that was built on the backs of enslaved Black people that did not even accept Black students nor women in the first half of the 20th century. I'm cognizant that I, I was able to go there because there was something called the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement that got the Civil Rights Act passed and the Voting Rights Act passed and the Civil Rights Act of uh, 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 68, which was housing, the Fair Housing Act and got the Higher Education Act. There was no financial aid before 1966. There was only the GI Bill and the Higher Education Act, which was also a victory of the civil rights movement, ferried through Congress by Adam Clayton Powell. The Higher Education Act created financial aid that has benefited not only black students, but all students of all races who are economically and socially disadvantaged. And because of that political movement, that political action, that political change made possible for me to go to college. And I would say to that young person, you are in college today because of that struggle. And you have a responsibility as others made it better for you. You have to make it better for those who come behind you. You have to make it better for yourself. These people who are striving for power now, they want to put us back to 1933. It's not even just the Civil Rights Act. They want to undo the New Deal. They are bringing back child labor as we speak. As we speak, 500 bills have been introduced in state legislatures across the country, limiting in some way our right to freely cast our ballot. So I would say to the young people that if you want a better life, you have to be involved. That you think politics doesn't affect you, it affects every aspect of your life. You just don't know it. Because people didn't want you to know it. That, that's the reason why we don't have civics. Now, I have a personal theory. It's a personal theory I have. I think they eliminated civics from high school curriculum once they saw Black people were getting the right to vote. They said, well, if they have the right to vote and they know what to do with that vote and how to work that vote, then they, they might move us out of the way. So those are some of the things that I would say to a young person.
Okay, we've got one more, uh, two more questions that I know of. Um, Mr. Harris, are you ready with your question? I, I'm going to have to go after these two. I'm, I'm supposed okay. to pick, pick somebody up at six o'clock. They're going to be oh, mad. I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it, Mr. Harris, real quickly. And then Ms. Chalfin, I think that's the name I'm saying correctly. Real quickly, Mr. Harris, what's your question? First of all, Larry Ham, I'm glad that you're running for Senate. And I got to tell you that uh, I think the secret to your success is going to be exposure, getting you from Cape May to Bergen County. And I would encourage everybody who's connected to a college campus to encourage those students on that campus, whether they're the Black Student Organization or the SGA or some other group, to invite Larry Ham to come to the campus because every student can influence members of their family. The second piece is that we've got some really hard work to do, and this is not a spectator sport. Everybody who's concerned about Mr. Ham's victory has to do hard work in doing voter registration, voter education, and getting people to go to the polls on, no, on January 4th. There's no shortcut. There's hard work involved. It's got to be done by those of us who believe that Larry Ham can win. There are five candidates, four candidates in this race. <laughs> and he is better qualified than just about all of them. When you look at his education, when you look at his uh, uh, political address, when you look at his campaigns, this is a fellow who has been consistent, dependable throughout his career. And we just have to tell our community that don't get caught in the political party politics of the county leadership. It's corrupt, it's unfair, and you know, how can you endorse somebody just because you're the party chairman before you go out and ask the people in the county what you want the people in the county to have? The system is broken, but we've got to work hard to get as many people, one, registered who are not registered, because the young people who are not registered are not committed to either party yet. They're not. So they're not even informed about the party system. So this is what we need to do. Everybody who belongs to a church, go ask your pastor to invite Larry Ham to come to your church. Politicians get there. They show up every four years. Let's get Larry Ham there this year before June. And that's all I have to say. I'm willing, you so. you know, I'm supportive. Keep up the good work, but we got to get you throughout the state of New Jersey, Larry. And we're going to work hard to do that. And thank, thank you so much. I, I, I'm, not even in the, I'm not even I, in the state. I'm going to work my hiney off. <laughs> thank you. I thank God for James Harris. Mm -hmm. James <laughs> Harris is why, is one of the reasons why I'm sitting before you today. I met James Harris when I was 13 years old. He was my first track coach. And he helped take someone who had no innate at athletic ability, none whatsoever, and mold that person to become state champion in the two-mile run. I was the state champion and record holder. Uh, for the two-mile run for Group 1 schools, um, nine minutes and, uh, what was it, brother? Had nine minutes and 36 seconds for, for two-mile run. And he influenced me not only in terms of athletic development, but he influenced my mind and, and gave me the kind of foundation I needed to see the world in a different way. And to, to move in a different way. I think there was one more question, right? Thank you, Brother Harris. Miss Helen. Miss Helen, I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt Mr. you. I yes. don't want to I don't want to interrupt you. I I this is rude of me, but I just want to, even if Lawrence Ham just hears this, um, my name is Deborah Chaffin, and I just want to say to get the youth, the Hispanic. Um, engaged, I would recommend that everyone get educated with the Central Park Five, where Yusef Salam is now in New York City as a councilman. And yes. they went through so much mess under Trump. Um, and yep. that needs to be exposed. Um, and that, right. I mean, because I mean, that because will come, come back. back. That will come that will only come back 
And um, I just wanted to say that. And one million people died under Trump with COVID. He knew about it in November before the next year. And he did nothing, did nothing. One million people died. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. I just want to say those two things. If you can get Yousef Salam and the other um, gentleman from Central Park 5 to be mm -hmm. spokespeople to get out to the youth, I think it would make a difference. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. Oh, sir. stop apologizing. You're more no, than no, welcome. Well you were you were you were the last person I had well anyway. Said. So look, um, well Larry said. Kim, you are welcome back in this uh, circle whenever. Just let us know. The door is open. Doesn't have to be a Sunday. We can Thank gather you. when is convenient for you. I'm asking everybody yeah. on this call. Um, yep, I'm endorsing him, and I'm asking that you all will commit to. Look in your phone. And if you're in my phone and you live in New Jersey, you got a text message from me this morning saying, why, why not? If not us, who? And we cannot keep complaining. This is our time. We can make it happen. Mr. Ham, I know you have to go. If everybody else can just hang out on the call and we can talk a little bit more about next steps. Um, Mr. Ham. Oh, and before I hang up, and before I let you go, I, I know, I know. I, everybody on this call needs to challenge Black organizations, Black politicians, all these party line people, you know, it's not about you becoming a judge or you getting a job in a new whatever. It's about what is you don't do when you're doing what the party line tells you to do. We need to be asking them to what gain, to whose gain. If it's for your personal gain, then it doesn't help us as a collective. So anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Ham. And I just want to well, say, Larry, you can't, no, stay, you can't, go, you can't stay through the door if everybody doesn't come with you. That's yeah. right. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It re I really enjoyed it. See how fast time moved? When we started talking, the sun was in my face. The sun was rising, and now it's dark. And we probably could have went another hour. But I, I did promise someone whose car broke down that I would give them a ride home from work. Go and they, you and blue we, devil. Go <laughs> you blue devil. Yes, yes, yes. And brother, thank you, thank you. good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. I, I, I thank you. And if you all would just hang on, let's talk for a few more minutes. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. We will definitely be in touch. All right, Demo. Oh, Stay strong, right. brother. Thank you. Okay. All right. Hey, y'all. I thought that was a really good call. Let me remove all the spotlights and then we can just <laughs> chat for a minute. Um, um, anybody have anything overwhelming that you just want to say that maybe you didn't get a chance to say while we were? I would like to know how many people on this call who live in New Jersey who were not aware of Mr. Ham's candidacy. If you can use your electronic hand, wow. Yeah, I, I think this is a problem that we need. Yeah, um, if we can, we got to get the word out. Um, those of you who are in South Jersey, especially, I don't know that he has connections. I mean, I think people associate him with North Jersey, so we need to fix that. Make sure that people across the state know that he's running. Um, but anyway, that's enough of me talking. Who has something that you're just dying to say? Uh, Bill, Linda, oh, Valerie Dale, go ahead. Hi, everybody. I just want to, um, I know I hear everybody speaking that they're in South Jersey. So um, there are some events coming up. I put it in the chat. We want everybody's support. We want to see, you know, your families there, your neighbors there, your community, your church members to support um, Lawrence Ham on his candidacy. If you look in the chat, I have one in there that's coming up um, uh, February 18th. Um, Janet Society of Love is hosting a Black History Month program. Um, the guest speaker is going to be Lawrence Ham, Tim uh -huh. Alexander, and also Stephen Young. Um, I put the flyer there, Stephen Young. He's the president of National Action Network, South Jersey. And Tim Alexander, he's actually running for um, Democrat for Congress in J-02. Um, and he's, I believe, in Atlanta County as well. And then Lawrence Ham, he's coming all the way down. I think that's three hours. So we, we want to see everybody there um, on February 18th, between 1 and 4. He's due to speak at 2, but th there's going to be other speakers there. And it's at the Martin Luther King Center, 207 Main Street in Whitesboro, New Jersey. And they have a historic situation going on down there that he went down to help with. And then also, um, I hear you, everybody saying that they want to have a forum. So I have a space that's already set up at the Alm Center in Bristol. 
we were just going down and we were going about the community, but we could make it something huge. It's an 800 um, space event. I told the uh, person that's in charge, I only need 100 seats, but we could pack it out. So I put that information in the chat, but I could also be speaking to, you know, other people here. My number is, I'll put in a chat, it's 973-489-0411. And I'll put my email as well. That's all. And we, oh, we're also going to try to set up something in Willenboro. So if anybody want to help with that. Yeah, we got a call. I spoke with someone just before I got on this call today. I was telling, uh, I don't know if you're on that phone with, um, uh, I was telling Larry that there's a uh, reverend who's a friend of his who said that she's willing to host. I think I did. Um, hear that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think I did hear that. And we could also host something at the JFK where that other candidate's office is, Andy Kim. His office is in there. They have a whole lot of space in that particular JFK center, if you're familiar with um, that establishment. It's the rec center down there for that whole community. Um, Those are um, yeah. Um, yeah. This, Ms. Watts? No, this is Lola. Hi, Lola. Yeah. Hi. How are you? I I said. Yeah, I sent uh, Miss Dale a uh, uh, message on her chat. Could you please check your chat? Uh, mm -hmm. We have a friend in common somehow. <laughs> um. Anyway, I, I would like to um to arrange for Mr. Ham to come to a school up here, a high school. So who do we reach out to? That would be Valerie. Okay. Oh, that's good. Okay. In her email, yeah. she just posted Lola. She just posted and she gave her number, which is on the chat. Oh, it is on the chat. Okay, yeah. good. Valerie, yeah. I, I have a quick question for Valerie. Valerie, what what has to be done to get a letter to all the Black organizations asking them to co-sponsor to co a debate of all the candidates? Yeah, that would be great. Valerie, are you still with us? Yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, we I, we I put together a list the other day and some of the ones that come off the top of my head are obviously when Black women gather, we'll support whatever um, needs to be done. And, um, you know, the Amer um, Association of Black Women Lawyers who um, advertised this call for us today, I appreciate that. Garden State Bar Association, NAACP, um, you know, the Urban League, um, Divine Nine, there must be a local pan how do you say that, Panhellenic chapter. Um, you know, all of us, we need to come together. The churches, you know, all these people who are on the payroll, like stop, like, you know, you're on the payroll to whose advantage? Not to the advantage of, of Black folks in, in, in Jersey. Um, and I think that we just need to not be shy about calling that out. Um, so I'm sorry, Valerie. Uh, so those are some of the, you just think if all of those organizations themselves said, you know what, we got a hundred people, we have a hundred people who will show up. The message says that you cannot ignore us. And that's the kind of energy that we have to put out there. A message that says it's not one here, two there, like, no, there's a lot of us. And, you know, you got people across the country who are just outraged. And I just think we can keep talking about it or we can do something about it. And it's time that we do something about it. So, um, we can definitely connect, Helen. So I sent my number to you. I'll send it to you again, but we could definitely connect. I have that free space down there, Bristian, March 16th. So we have enough time to, you know, pull something together. Mm -hmm. I just said, did you get my message? I have to search back. I have to yeah, search a lot back. in the chat. Oh, okay. She's going to take a copy of the chat, Lola, so she'll get it. Okay. Um, and Lenny, you have a question? Yes, three people. Uh, not, not really a question. What I was trying to stress is that we have to really reach out to our Black-owned media. We did talk about our Black churches. That is important. But also, we have Black-owned media. Not just Black-targeted, but Black-owned and that's a two-way street. We need to support them, and they will support us. And that's how we can get our message out before, during, and after the election. All three of them are important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, um, Ms. Mohammed. Oh, thank you. Um, I was, well, I, I guess I'm actually going to um, uh, echo Mr. Thomas's uh, sentiments. I think that it's important for us to reach and connect with all of our special interest groups. And, and um, I, I know that the majority places of worship um, in New Jersey are churches, but we have to consider churches, synagogues, because there are many, many Jewish groups who do not agree with um, what's going on and who do not support Israel and who are standing firmly for these fire we um and, and he said something um brother larry said something really important about the black muslim uh community in new jersey right. there wouldn't be no muslim presence and and acceptance and freedoms in the united states if it wasn't for the um the struggle of the black muslims in the united states of america and especially in new jersey and so when i think about um uh, Governor Murphy and how he has pandered the Muslim community, he has moved more towards non-Black Muslims and moved farther away from Black Muslim um, support um, because he feels his, and my, my, my thoughts and opinions, that the money is with the non-Black Muslims. And so that's something that we as the Black Muslim movement is very important for us that we have to tell um, one another, it's time to come together and it's time to restructure in the way um, that we did in the 60s and the 70s, and which is really important. Um, somewhere we've we've lost the spark. But the other thing that I was gonna mention when it comes to special interest groups, um, although um, yes, um, First Lady Tammy Murphy is um, pushing and leading the, um, the charge in the um, infant mortality um, spaces, but that's because of government funding. And so we we know where people's hearts are. And, and so I think it's important for us to get connected with the clinic, get connected with um, the WIC offices, get connected with other spaces too, where we have people who are not necessarily impressed with um, the fact that, um, you know, her, the, the first lady's name or face is behind this movement, but, We've had needs before she took government funding and, and and led the charge. I mean, sadly, there always has to be a faith in front of many of these movements. Um, the other thing that I was going to mention, and this is something Brother Larry and I have talked about, and I've discussed in a lot of spaces, the disability vote is a vote that continues to be well, um, very much ignored. And that's a 15% voter base that is not... Um, supported, it is ignored, and, and it has to be recognized as an important voter block that could truly take us over the edge. And, and me being a person who is um, very active in the disability movement, not just nationally, but especially here in New Jersey, I can tell you that um, specifically for Black people with disabilities, especially um, caregivers, but especially Black adults with disabilities, we are not pushing hard enough and strong enough um, to encourage uh, Black people, uh, Black adults with disabilities to be um, to be registered voters. And so that's an education that I certainly don't mind bringing some people along um, and having another conversation um, with women, um, Black women who gather to help people understand how important it is. Don't, don't think for a minute that if your loved one has, for instance, I have sons on the autism spectrum, that your loved one has autism and it means that they cannot vote. They still have the right to vote and there's ways how we can support them. That's good information. Thank you so much, Ms. Mohammed. Judy, you have a question. Yeah, I actually just wanted to ask Mr. Workman if he's still on the call, uh, if if he was convinced of either of the scenarios that he gave, was he convinced to vote? He's, was he convinced to vote? He's definitely planning to vote. He's not planning yeah, not he, to vote. No, but he gave two scenarios and wanted to be convinced to vote. Would he have been convinced to vote on any of those oh, two? Oh, with the answer. You're asking, did he find the answer convincing? Dre? Is DeAndre still there? He yes, is. I am. No. Can you hear me, guys? Yes, yes. now we can. Yes. Now we do. Oh, okay. 
I'm still trying to get used to this technology myself. <laughs> but uh, hi, Lola, how you doing? Uh, um, thank you. Nice to hear your voice. <laughs> likewise, likewise. Um, I pose that. Let me just say this here. I pose that question because um, an, of a number of reasons. One, um, there's a, a prevalent sentiment in our community that black men um, do not plan to vote. And because they don't see either party as weighing in on any of the interests that, you know, um, black men have. That was the, the, the real reason why I asked the question. Um, but I really wanted to. Be, and second, I really do respect um, Mr. Um, Ham. Um, I followed him for more than 30 years and I've been peripheral to the organization for that many years as well. Um, while my main residence is in Florida, I still live in New Jersey as well. And so to answer your question um, to the to woman who asked the question, I did find his answer to be a reasonable response. And I say a reasonable response because I, like um, Mr. Ham, do believe that at some point, all that we can do is have a discussion with the brothers who do not want to vote. Um, because um, the, a, a lot of the most often when we hear people who say, oh, I'm not going to vote, um, um, I think what they are lacking, my opinion, is historical context. A lot of us, a lot of our young kids, you know, don't know about our history and um, and without that important context, it's really hard to, to 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 convince someone who is emotionally stuck on their position, as Mr. Ham said. And so I do, too, believe that we do have to have a discussion. And as Lola, you know, would attest to, you know, because we've had many, many conversations about this. Sometimes we have to have these conversations starting with our children from a very early age so that the context is there and so that. Um, it's easier to, for us to make the appeal to our young people. Um, and But without that context, it's it's very difficult and challenging. So I think Mr. Ham's response was a reasonable one, one that we have to approach, you know, um, um, our young black men and 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 have a discussion with them. And sometimes, you know, it, it's it's not a discussion that can be had with sound bites. It's really a discussion that really needs to take into consideration our history and our struggle and 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 what that means for all black people. So I hope that it answers your question. And I just and just to be clear, um, those were hypotheticals that I posed to Mr. Ham because I do plan to vote. Yeah. He better I, vote. Yeah. Listen, I, I, in the chat, I dropped in the chat a, a YouTube video that I just happened to have watched today. And it's a black attorney. He has a podcast that he does and he uh, addresses that question. And he just goes bullet. But and, and, and interesting thing about him is he was a former Republican who, you know, got upset about something and then was a Democrat or vice versa. And now he's an independent. So he talks about going through the progressions, but he, like Mr. Ham says, like, we must vote and you cannot vote for Trump. And he gives you, he goes historically through things that you can use to um, counter those kinds of arguments. So I encourage you all to watch that video and get some um, insight on how you can respond if that question should present itself. And Helen, um, also, Helen, I'd like to also say tonight, I guess I've put on your um, broadcast. I didn't want to interrupt. This is Deborah again. Tonight at yeah. MSNBC at nine o'clock will be um actual um yeah it will be um a thing about black men in America Road to 2024 by yeah. Tremaine Lee and oh, um yeah. yes Tremaine yeah. Lee and yeah. Charles Coleman who is a black um um, civil rights attorney gentleman on television and um, to the gentleman that just asked about voting I looked and I'm 68 but I saw how our forefathers foremothers fought to get the right to vote there was a movie with Oprah Winfrey and she was old looking and they asked her to 
tell how many senators was in the House. And then before that, there were Black people that had to tell how many jelly beans was in a jar. And yeah. I'm saying, oh, no, I am not going back to that. And on top of that, I keep saying with um, with um, Black youth and Hispanic youth, look at the Central Park Five where Trump took out an $85,000 um, um, advertisement in New yeah. York City after the five Black and Hispanic yeah. children were not accused of raping a white woman, and he wanted them killed anyway. So what yep. do you think? If he, he gets back in office, he's yep. going to do. He's going to have Black people, young Black men and Black uh, black and Hispanic children killed off the street if he gets back in office. Yep. I'm sorry, Helen. I just had to oh, say. Oh, you're fine. It's a passionate subject. We totally understand. Good afternoon, also, Helen. Uh, this is this is Haraya. How are you? Hey, Miss Bay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, can I can I um get a comment in? Yes, go ahead. Yes, I I, I um have listened, and I am um of the mindset. I want to shoot this out 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 here. Um, we I I really feel that as we're fighting this fight, we have to actually walk a double. We have to do a two step. We have to walk a double fight. Um, after 400 years we're st of struggle, we're st still battling racism. And now uh, there is uh, uh, so much going on that's trying to reverse all of our struggle back to mm -hmm. um, I wish I was in Dixie uh, uh, time, okay? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, 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 and uh, yeah, that's that's what Make America Great stands for. Is I wish I was in Dixie, and we all know what Dixie represented. Um, I, I just want to throw this thought out here. Um, we all know that the culture that is running this country has exhibited uh, overwhelmingly um, a, a characteristics of it, it's not able to govern humanely and fairly, okay? I, I do believe that the humane spirit rests in the African-American uh, culture. Um, we got people, you know, uh, Mr. Ham was just talking about the nuclear weapons and we're saying these words, just letting them roll off our tongue as if it's, you know, as we're, t we're talking about buying candy in a candy shop, you know, th that is devastating information and thoughts um, that we have to face with people in leadership. And, 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 and lastly, I just want to say this. We own, we are connected with the most important commodity in this uh, uh, global, uh, on this globe. Uh, uh, out of the Congo comes coltan, which you cannot really verify any eye without coltan. So I'm saying we should do a, we need to be doing a two-step as we're fighting this fight. We need to be fighting to uh, uh, negotiate with the leaders of the, of the Congo, whereas just imagine, just take a minute and be courageous enough to imagine an African or African-American owned uh, communications company uh, uh, on the level of a Verizon or Comcast or T-Mobile that is in control of the coal, uh, the, the coltan, therefore in control of the global uh, 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 use of Wi-Fi. Just imagine that. And we're hiring right. African-American uh, uh, and African people. So I just, I just want to put those uh, thoughts out there that as we're fighting this battle, we have bigger uh, battles to fight. We have to get in leadership of this country that we have built, that the blood of our ancestors is in the ground. And I believe this is God's mission on having us come through this whole uh, 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 horrific experience of slavery is to bring a humane consciousness to this uh, a country and to the globe. So that's, that's my my two cents. I know it's a little far-fetched out there, but I really believe we got to have a little bit more than, than just trying to put this uh, 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 
okay. and, a, and a round okay. circle, a, a, a round circle into a square. Hey, what, whatever you know, but um, you know what I'm trying to say. That, that's yeah. my thank um, you. Thank you for those comments, and we're gonna do one more comment, and then I don't know if Bill's still here, but if Bill and Linda want to give our closing words, we'll be done. Matthew, very quickly, please. How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, good evening. Well, I guess for you guys, it's a good evening, everyone. Good Just very here. quickly. Um, I believe the question was, well, a comment. To get young people, especially Black young people, interested in voting, I don't think that, this is just my opinion, so please don't get offended, everyone. Um, I'm going to, I guess, reveal my age here. Um, older people, Blacks living in the United States now, comment or communicate to young people to get them to vote, especially young Black people. It's just to scare the bejesus out of them. And I don't know if that's really the 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 actual greatest way to get them to understand that they need to vote right now, because maybe the question that we should be asking them specifically is what are they afraid of, of living there? They live there. So for them, having a Donald Trump maybe back there, it's no big deal because, hey, you know, no one is going to do anything for me anyway. Their mindset may be that way. And I didn't survive this so far. So what else can't I survive? I think a better question is to ask them what really is, what are they afraid of living there? If they can really see what to be afraid of in order to answer that question. Because, you know, they say, well, I survived this and I survived that. And what, how much bad can it be? How much worse can it be? Excuse me. How much worse can it be? Maybe starting from there to see what exactly would change in their life if they vote or what wouldn't. How much worse really could it be for them? Now, I feel a little strange because, as you can see, I don't live in the United States. But I'm concerned about what happened to my people there. I have the choice not to live there, and I've chosen. And to be very honest with you, I wouldn't live there if you paid me. Um, but that's my answer to it. But I still vote. I still vote because I I believe it can get worse. Maybe they have forgotten that they lived under a Donald Trump administration for four years, and it was terrible. Maybe they just said, well, I survived that, so how much worse could it be? Start there with them and ask them to come up with the question. Give the answer to, quest to that question of how much worse it can be. Maybe to go that route, you can say, hey, look, you know what? Um, Linda was talking about a lot of people don't understand what, maybe didn't understand what fascism is, where it came from. Okay. You know, that could be a way to say, hey, look, you know what? You thinking that you, you can have these rights after this guy get in there, he's coming for you, bro. And it means I this. think that's the one thing that definitely needs to, you know, if you're a racist or whatever you may be, and you think that is the the, the harm is going to stop at black people, gay people, or whoever it is that you don't like, you're just foolish. Right. Um, it, it will affect all of us. But anyway, thank you for your comments, Matthew. I'm going to give the last words to um, Bill Davis and Linda. Thank you both for hosting this conversation. I think you did a fantastic job. And yeah. we'll certainly be doing more conversations. But did either of you or both of you have something that you want to close us out with? Go ahead, Bill. Sure. Um, Helen, thank you and all the people who are on the call. I think that um, it definitely brought much needed attention to Larry's campaign and his accomplishments. But I hope that, um, and I appreciate you know some of the ideas that people have presented, but for me, the question is what our action steps going to be. Larry made some very specific requests. He requested that we donate it to the campaign. He requests that we get petition signed so that he would be on the ballot. He requests that people invite him to various locations to speak. And so whether you do all three, one of those three, but you know, I think that yes, you know, we can do all these other ideas that people are talking about. But the bottom line is that, you know, we need to, and this is African American History Month. And so if there's ever a time for us to be in action, this is the time for us to be in action. So I hope that people will take away whatever they take away from, but please take at least one of those three action steps. Absolutely. Thanks, Bill. 
Um, this uh, side note is we need to ask, talk to young people and stop talking to them as elders and we got to put ourselves in their shoes. And so, you know, I always talk, I told students the other day, unfortunately for three generations, people have been manufacturing their reality for them. After the heroin and the crack cocaine, people have taken advantage of that. And so a lot of young people, and I'm around them all the time, I'm so happy, they don't think like us. And it depends on their economic status, but I tend to be about the, around the ones who don't have anything. They're moving from place to place. Um, and so their immediate needs make it very difficult. The other thing is the way the history, I'm sorry, even in terms of how to get the information, they don't get context and they're accustomed to not getting context when you wanna give them context. And I can tell you my 13 year old grandniece told me, she said, why are you giving me all this information? They've been groomed to not even listen to a lot of information. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take a little work. But I, I just want to, you know, every, not every Tuesday, but it seems here recently, I do, a, I co-host for Gloria Brown Marshall. And before we start, I always do this little piece. So I'm going to leave with this. Voting is more than one of your civic responsibilities, having the right to vote, showing up at the polls and voting. It serves as a significant tool in our citizens, our citizens' civic toolbox. We must more importantly know how to manage this tool to help us manage the elected officials who are charged to serve the public. Remember, elected officials are not leaders. Leaders are those who are willing to die for the masses. Nevertheless, there are other important matters to consider around your civic duty. Voting is just one we can act upon, perhaps while you're waiting in line, checking your cell phone, washing your clothes at the laundromat, or any time you remain still for a few. Ask yourself, am I voting for a party or for a person? Who or what entity or organization is funding that person's campaign? That will let you that will let you know who has their ear and influence. Also, what influence would need to be neutralized? You can find this out, and I always talk about if because the audience is New York and New Jersey, New York State Board of Elections, New Jersey Board of Election Enforcement, the Federal Election Commission, OpenSecrets.org. What about the candidate? Is the candidate knowledgeable about the issues? Is the person knowledgeable and well informed and able to articulate a strategy? resulting in changing conditions and seeking transformation or reform, which only means the stat maintain the status quo. Does the person have a proven track record in social justice and advocacy or whatever you feel is important to you? And from spirituality, does it matter whether the person is spiritual? Willingness, does the person have the willingness to surround themselves with competent, intelligent, principled and committed people that represent the good you wanna see in your community? And five, does the candidate have a demonstrated record of community or political courage and resilience for the community and not for themselves? I'll leave with that. So Helen, just one last request. If yes, it, yes. Is it possible that the um, chat can be emailed to people or segments of the chat could be emailed? So the events, the different information that is included in the chat. a lot of chat. information. Yeah, yeah that I could be will, emailed um, out. I think that would be incredibly helpful. Let me say also, you can go to the bottom of your chat. You'll see three little dots. If you click on those dots, it will ask you to um, copy the chats. But in the um, interim, I will make a point of, because uh, it was a lot of information in the chat. So I will, oh, somebody said their dots are at the top. So yeah, mine are at the bottom. So you'll, you'll see three little dots and it'll say copy chat and it'll copy it to your hard drive for you. Helen, this uh, is Deborah. This is Deborah one more time. I just thought of something just now. Is there any way that you or um, Bill can um, look back on how hard it was for black people to vote? I, I know there's black and white pictures that are out there somewhere and what they had to do to just get the vote in. Um, is there any way that you could not email it, but just have it picturized out there so that people could just see Black people in line where it says whites only, or whatever it was, um, just to show how hard it was in Black and white for Black people to be able to vote? I, don't, I, know, I know it's out there, but if there's any way that you can just find it, I would Really I mean, again, that. this is Black History Month. I think you're going to see all these programs on TV. I recommend that you sit down with your children, your grandchildren, and make them watch them. Um, yeah. If they don't show them at any other time, they show, they're showing them at this time of year. 
Um, and there are so many images out there, what you're speaking of. So I hear what you're saying. And each of us has a responsibility to make sure that the next generation knows what happened for, mm -hmm. um, for them to be able to stand where they are. So on that note, everybody, I'm going to take us off of, um, um, and, oh, and do watch the program that, was it you? Um, who just talked about the program with, Tri what's his name? Tra Trailing... Oh, nine is it nine o'clock on MSNBC? Yeah. Tell me the um uh, reporter's name again. I'm sorry. Dre, you just mentioned him yesterday. What's his name? Tremaine. Tre yeah. Tremaine. Oh, Tremaine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Around mm -hmm. for a minute. I, I, I would suspect that that's gonna be a really good um program. So um I'm going to um, try to do too many things at once. But anyway, you all, it's been a great program. Thank you for your input. And I'm going to stop recording at this point and invite you all to come back, not next week, but the following week. Next week is football. So do your thing. <laughs> Watch football if that's what you must do. But we will gather again on the following Sunday, which is the 18th. And we're going to talk about finance. So another important topic for us as a Black community. Absolutely. So, thank you all. Thank, thank you, Helen. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Everybody it's, have nice a good working with, it's nice working with you, Bill. This is our first it's time. My, my, my pleasure. My pleasure. I got upgraded, you know. <laughs> 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 all right, everybody. On that, right, night, everybody. on that note, thank you for another amazing yeah. gathering. And I'm going to stop yeah. recording. Right now. Take care now. Bye. Bye -bye. Thank you, Helen, Linda, and Bill for facilitating and hosting this Zoom. It was fantastic. Who's that? Diane? Thank you, Diane. Yes, we'll have to do it again. All right, yes. all right. Let's and do it again. Get on our homework. Get on our do homework. Do it again. Yes, yeah, yeah, do it again. Yeah, yeah take care. All right, all right, Joe. Right, take care. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.